touched on last Sunday. Last Sunday I, I talked about a scripture that's been a very fa favourite scripture of mine for a very, very long time. That scripture is Psalm 68. Psalm 68 and verse 1. Verse 1, and I guess the uh, version that I had learnt it in initially was uh, New American Standard, so that's the one that stayed in my mind. It's slightly different in uh, NIV, but in the New American Standard it said, Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, those who hate him flee from before him. The smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish before God. We used to sing the first part of that as a chorus, let God arise. Then in verses 3 and 4 it goes into another part we used to sing as a chorus where it says, sing unto God, sing praises to his name. Extol him that rides or rideth on the heavens by his name. You must have learned that out of the King Jameth version of it. <laughs> called the Iths at the end. Let me just tell you, and I did this last week, I know that this will be a much shorter version of that, but where this psalm came from and what inspired David to share the share these actual wording. The psalm was inspired, David was uh, inspired when the Ark of the Covenant was returned to Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant, a piece of furniture in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, and then when Israel came into the Promised Land, they built a tent in a, a, an area called Shiloh, and it, and it stayed there. But when the uh, Ark of the Covenant was in the, in the wilderness and in the tabernacle, the very presence of God would come down in the most amazing way. The presence would come down as a, a cloud by day, and it would come down by fire at night. The area in the wilderness, we know, we know now, uh, during the day is exceptionally hot and at night is exceptionally cold. So at night God was like a, a fire so he warmed Israel up. Through the day when it was so hot he was like a cloud over them so he cooled things down. But what happened was there was a time when Israel they had been at war with the Philistines had suffered a terrible defeat and because they had been defeated some thought that it was because they didn't have the Ark of the Covenant, this piece of furniture with them. So they had brought the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh onto the battlefield. The Philistines overcame them anyway and they captured the Ark. The Philistines took the Ark back to, to, to Ashdod. They put it in, in one of their uh, temples. They had a pagan god there. But the pagan god fell down the first night. So the second night they put it back up. And the second night it fell down, but the second night when it fell, it actually smashed into many pieces. Then the Philistines in Ashdod began to be uh, covered in tumors, and they recognized that the Israel's God was a very powerful God. And somehow the Israel, that the God of Israel was associated with the Ark of the Covenant. So they had to somehow get the Ark of the Covenant away. They put it on a cart. They were not willing to have any Philistines go with that cart. And they sent that cart back toward the area of uh, Palestine or um, Israel. And because they feared that they would all, all die. You know the first um, is Israelis, the Jews who saw it, they, they, they touched it, God struck them down. And so it was left in a small town. When David became king, he decided to bring the ark to Jerusalem, leading the way with exuberant dancing. And I know this portrays David, this picture, in a way that some people have a bit of trouble with, but I, I don't know what the dancing looked like back then. But I know if the scripture said it was exuberant, I know it would be the kind of dancing that many of us would look at and probably raise our eyes at. But I tell you what, God loved it. He loved the exuberant dancing that um, David showed before God as he led the ark into Jerusalem. And then in celebration, this he wrote Psalm 68. So if you do have a Bible, I'd love you to turn over to it. Psalm 68. We're just looking at verse 1 uh, and, and verse 2 rather. Psalm 68 begins of course with these amazing words. Let 
God arise. And I did talk last week a little bit about that. And I want this morning to touch more on what happens when God arises. Now, having told you to look up Psalm 68, I'm going to read a little section from the book of Numbers and chapter 10. Because even David's words, let God arise, were not words that he initially authored. He took them from the book of Numbers. He took them from a section of the book of Numbers where Moses described what happened in the wilderness. When God began to move, we know from the uh, record that we have that Israel had around 42 moves that are recorded from when they went in to the wilderness to when they came into the promised land. Now even though there are 42, they were not evenly spaced because the majority of those were in the first two years till they came to, uh, to the area on the very edge, uh, to Kadesh Barnea, the very edge of the promised land where the spies went in. We understand that when the spies brought back an evil report and God said that he would now wait till that generation had died out, that they waited at Kadesh Barnea for many years probably somewhere toward 38 years before they moved on. And we know that from Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 14. But in Numbers chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 33, it says, So when, oh sorry, sorry, so they set out from the mountain of the Lord, traveled for three days. The Ark of the Covenant, that piece of furniture, went before them during those three days to find a place to rest. The cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. Whenever the ark set out, Moses cried, Rise up, O Lord! May your enemies be scattered. May your foes flee from before you. So what would happen was that when God determined that it was time for Israel to move on, the cloud would rise and the cloud would begin to move. God gave Israel, God gave the number of the, the children of Israel somewhere around 2 million people. He gave them three days. Three days to pack up, three days to fold up the tents, three days to get everything together and to begin to follow the cloud. And so David is taking this, this initial uh, uh, cry that Moses would call out. God is arising or let God arise. I had said last time that the Psalm 68 verse 1 in the NIV says, May God arise. And I just find that a little bit syrupy. Now I made the mistake of saying, I don't like May. And then everyone laughed and one or two people prodded poor old May. Who I, I don't know if she was quite listening at that stage, but she certainly was after that. But I, I, I just didn't like the thought of, oh please, won't you let God arise. I like the thought that Moses saw the cloud of God arising. And so he's crying out, let God arise. He was excited. Yeah. You excited? I'm yeah. sorry, we're in church. <laughs> Let's get back and not get too excited. So the cry was that the presence of God was moving. Gave the people a little bit of time. So now let's come back to Psalm 68. So verse 1. May God arise from the NIV. But then it says, and, and the psalm in verses 1 and 2 will talk about three things that will happen when God arises. I want to go through each of the three. Then at the end, I just want to talk about how or one aspect of the application of this. So the first thing it said, may God arise, may his enemies be scattered. So when God arises, the first thing is that his enemies are scattered. Word that, that is used here was a word. Uh, that men uh, that was used to those who were who were hostile. So when it says that God's enemies be scattered, that His enemies be scattered, it is those who are hostile toward God. Uh, it really makes it to our television news. But if you follow some of the Christian news sites, you will hear about the increasing persecution of Christians around the world. I find that some of these sites are more accurate than some of my Facebook friends. I have some more extreme Facebook friends who will often put up wonderful posts that exaggerate the number of Christians that are being martyred or, or, or different things. And I've, I've read, you know, the last year 100,000 Christians lost their life. And then I 
I, I go to groups like Open Doors or um, Barnabas or some of these others and I get, I get more accurate figures. But there are certainly uh, amazing levels of persecution for God's people. Uh, from Open Doors, who I find fairly conservative with their numbering, they said that through last year, 215 million Christians face significant persecution around the world. They said that over 3,000 Christians were martyred. They said somewhere around 800 church buildings were destroyed. Now when they talk about church buildings, they're not talking about homes where uh, God's people met. They're, they're talking about buildings where, where local communities, of, of the, the local family, the local Christian family, gathered for that neighborhood or for that town or that section of that city. But I look and see that North Korea, for the 13th year in a row, is the most dangerous place on earth to be a Christian. Open doors say the next is Afghanistan, and Somalia, Sudan, and then Pakistan. Extraordinary things happen. I remember watching a little bit of an SBS news probably about three or four weeks back, and they were showing some film that an Australian tourist had been able to take in North Korea. They asked him how he was able to take this film, because uh, ordinarily a tourist is not permitted to uh, film. And uh, he said, they looked through my bags numerous times, they looked at my camera and they questioned me, but they kept looking for something more. And so I, I asked through an interpreter, what are you looking for? And the, the soldiers every time said the same thing, we are looking for Bibles. So they gave him the camera back because they expected that as a Westerner, he'd be trying to take Bibles into North Korea. And so with that camera, he was able to uh, just bring back to Australia and uh, on that SBS news clip, just uh, some of the scenes from North Korea. And when God arises, his enemies, those who are hostile to him, begin to be scattered. So I want to see God arise. Amen. Because I want to see his enemies scattered. Now note that it's his enemies, not necessarily your enemies. You understand sometimes our enemies, if I can call them enemies, um, may not be those that God considers enemies. Sometimes we get upset with um, someone and, uh, and that person may not have done something that makes them hostile toward God. So the second thing, so I look at Psalm 68, as God arises, it said, those who hate him, the NIV says his foes, but you know, that's a bit soppy for me. All right, those who hate him will flee. And then in the next part it says, and they'll be driven away like smoke is driven away in the wind. Uh, the word for hate, this particular word used in this psalm, was used in the Old Testament for hard attitude of opposing detesting and despising another or other. So here, of course, it's opposing, detesting and despising God. And we tend to think of those who will be those who despise God as perhaps the um, atheists, as humanists who will take a very strong stand. But um, Jesus, in his time here on earth, gave us a slightly different perspective. I'm reading from John chapter 15 and verse 21. To his own disciples, he said, they will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. And, and Wendy so wonderfully brought out that not only to have seen him, the Lord Jesus, was to have seen the Father, but over and over, particularly in John's Gospel, the issue is Jesus was saying, you've got to accept I was sent by him. Because if I was sent by him, my words are true words. But then Jesus said, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me, that's what he's saying, whoever hates me, hates my father as well. Now so he was saying that the religious leaders hated him. And because the Jewish religious leaders hated him, Jesus was saying they hated the father. Now they would have said, no, that isn't true. Uh, Jesus was saying, to have seen me is to, see, to have seen him. I've been sent from him. So my words are his words. And if you hate me and you hate my words, you hate him and you hate his words. <coughs> so when we talk about God's enemies arising, those who hate him, uh, being uh, 
fleeing away and been driven away like smoke in the wind. We are talking about sometimes people who can be very religious. In John 16 and verses 2 and 3, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering service to God. They'll think they're doing God's will by actually putting to death those who are following His will most perfectly. So what happens when God arises? Those who hate Him flee and are driven away. There's a story, I know it's an old story and I know I've read it many times and you're going to hear it one more time. Some of you haven't, haven't heard it. Some of you have heard it, have forgotten it and you need to be reminded. <laughs> this is a story from Judson Cornwell who was a charismatic teacher, a most amazing man who is with the Lord now. And he wrote this, he said, some years ago, on a Sunday morning in our church, as we were moved to a very high level of praise, he said, it flowed like a river, continued to lift us higher and so high in the realms of praise, greater than we had experienced before. We could see no visible results among us, but there was a sense of understanding. God was doing something very extraordinary. That afternoon, I received a phone call from a young man who'd gone out from our congregation to pastor a church less than 200 miles from us in America, obviously. He asked what had been happening in our church at 11.15 that morning. I told him of the beautiful high level of praise we had reached and asked him why he had asked about it. He explained that at 11.15, one of his deacons stood to his feet in the midst of the meeting and began walking down the center aisle of the church with anger in his eyes. The treasurer of the church and its most moneyed member he had for years assumed the leadership in matters of policy, managed to have his own way before the entire congregation. He said, Pastor, I demand your resignation. I'm sick and tired of this emphasis on praise and your constant calls to prayer. I was familiar, Judson Cornwall now saying, I was familiar with the history of that church. The knew that deacon had successfully demanded and received the resignation of other pastors. The young pastor did not know what to do. He looked at the deacon, looked at his own wife and began to quake with an inner fear. The deacon advanced further, repeated his demand for a resignation. When he got to about the second row of pews, he suddenly stopped. His eyes opened wide as though he'd seen something. And he turned white with fear. He reached into his pocket, pulled out pen and paper, began to write a note. He handed it to the pastor behind the pulpit and hastily walked out the front door of the church. The note was his resignation as deacon. Soon as the man left the church, the glory of the Lord filled the building. The congregation came into a beautiful level of praise and worship. People began to make things right with one another. pastor still had not made any movement. He was dumbfounded. During the time of praise and worship, he asked the Lord what had happened. The Lord told him that the home church had gone into high praise, which enabled God himself to deal with the rebel directly. Now that story is good enough, but there's more. Yeah. This, however, is not the end of the story. Sometime later, I received a letter from a South American country where a young man from our congregation was laboring. He asked what had happened on that very Sunday. And he told me that three of the town officials had determined to close their church using some technicality of a previous violation of building codes in the construction of the building. The word had gone out that everyone and anyone who attended the church would be arrested. And not many people were taking a chance on that. At the time our congregation was in praise, this young man went to his late afternoon service, which they had instead of an any service, only to find an empty building. He went in, picked up his accordion, began to have a one-man song service. The blessing of the Lord began to fill his soul. So he had a testimony service. He was the only one. He was leading and participating. He then felt led to go ahead and preach. The message he preached for his people. Sorry, the message he prepared for his people. Even to giving an altar call. To his utter amazement, two members of the city council walked through the doors of the church and came to the altar. These men had been standing outside, watching through the window. 
having come to arrest anyone attending the service. They were so overawed at the sight of a preacher conducting a service with nobody there that they had remained to watch. The Lord came in his convicting power upon them and they were persuaded to enter his call. As a result, the church now has the official blessing of the city. They've had to enlarge the building twice since then. Praising of one congregation reached out many thousands of miles and did the impossible. When God arises, number two, those who hate Him flee and are driven away like smoke in the wind. Amen. The last one. When God arises, the wicked, the wicked perish like wax melting in front of the fire. When the Bible, the Old Testament uses this particular word for wicked, use it of people who treated others in a threatening, oppressive, dishonest and harmful way. The word was used not only to describe this kind of people, but it was used to describe their activity. And I think over the years I have seen this in different people. It was used to describe the, the tossing and the turning, the confusion in which they live and the perpetual agitation that the way they live causes others. And I find that quite amazing because I'm thinking of people that, that's, that I have seen that have been people that have moved into this agitated lifestyle. So the people they, they talk to, the people they meet with, they, they seem to pass on this agitation. So what happens when God arises? When God arises, number one, His enemies are scattered. Number two, those who hate him, his foes flee and are driven away in smoke in the wind. Number three, the wicked perish like wax melting before the fire. Let me just say my last remarks for, to the scripture back in Numbers chapter 10. Now back in Numbers chapter 10, we had read earlier from verse 33. 34 and 35. 35, when the ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, O Lord. Or from the words of Psalm 68, Let God arrive. Let his enemies be scattered. May your foes flee from before you. And already said that the movie, the children of Israel in the wilderness, that there are 42 recorded moves. Now they are in the wilderness for 40 years. But I've also said the majority of those moves happened in the first two years. Now some of you have had to move a few times. I don't know whether it gets easier, but I have never, that I can remember, having met anyone who said, look, I really love being in a job where they move me every 18 months. Never met anyone who said, look, I, I really love living out of a suitcase. I really love just doing all the packing up again. I love packing up. <laughs> When our son-in-law and daughter Terence and Emma uh, left uh, to go to America, in fact only last night Terence has sent this some um, clip of what their household looked like on the day before they left. Now my concern was that, that um, they would not have any extra help because um, when Terence and Emma have stayed with us, and I hope they don't ever listen to this, but they are not good at planning their time. They have to be somewhere by a certain time. Uh, 15 minutes before they have to be there, they begin doing all the stuff they should have been doing an hour earlier. Um, I have gone down, taken Terrence down on a flight which he's missed for being late, and he could hardly believe that they wouldn't let him on the plane. And I'm thinking, my goodness, I wouldn't have let you on the plane. I was seeing how everything diddle daddled around. But in this clip, the house is filled with people. There are children everywhere. There are adults everywhere. They go into one room. There are open cases everywhere. They're putting stuff in cases. I think Terence is just going around filming it all. It's, it's much more fun filming than actually doing it, I think. And then someone comes in with a whole lot of food. And, and they all rush big stuff to food. But that as I'm looking at that, I'm thinking, there but for the grace of God, go on. Mm -hmm. I have no desire to pack everything up and move to a foreign nation. Absolutely not. So when I think of the children of Israel, 
And I think that when they would hear Moses cry out, let God arrive, let his enemies be scattered, I don't think they would have thought, oh, hallelujah, let's move again. <laughs> I think there would be something within them that thought, oh, no. I can imagine the little Jewish wife saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> Just got all the sand off the saucepans and finally got everything clean and now we're see because the, the it, like it it just anything that you like in terms of settledness it turned upside down. That's what the psalm was saying that when God moves everything changes. And I'm sure there are many who who in the wilderness would have said, look, can, can we just stay here? I can again imagine a little Jewish wife just saying to her husband, please, please, love me. can we just stay here? You know, do we have to move? Can't we just stay here? Look, it's nice, it's nice, it's not, not too bad. But the difficulty was that God's leading, feeding, guiding, guarding were all related to His presence. Amen. So when His presence moved, all of these moved. His feeding, His guiding, His leading, all of His, His protection, it all moved and they were left in the wilderness. This is what the wilderness looks like. Would you like to be left in a place like that? Yeah. Where it's reaching some extraordinary temperatures through the day. And then at night it gets down to just bitterly cold temperatures. See, when God's presence moves on, the people have a choice. The people have a choice. And their, their choice is to either move forward with God or to make an intention and a choice that we're not going to move on, we're, we're going to stay here. We're going to stay right where we are. So God is arising. If you and I have to decide will we arise with Him or will we stay where we, we are. But the difficulty is that, that as I said, with His presence, was his guidance, his leading, his protection. All these things were part of his presence. So when the cloud rose and the cloud moved on, the presence moved on, his feeding, his guarding, his protection, all these things moved on. Life became very difficult for those who did not want to move. So we as a church, we are, we are to me, at a, at a place where where it's like, and I know I said this last week, but it's like I can, I can hear the call. And the call is to let God arise. Let His enemies be scattered. Let those who hate Him flee from before. Like, like God is saying, and I'm beginning to do something in a different kind of way. And I know how many of you like things just as they are. Now there's no full hand up. <laughs> And in the second row, there were a few half hands up. Because they couldn't see that no other hand went up behind them. I like things as they are. I don't like the thought of everything changing. But when God moves, everything changes. And so it's a, a choice. Do I hold on to my comfortable little comfort zone? Or do I step outside of my comfort zone? Because... The cloud of God is moving. And that's the choice that I have to make. I, I know it's a story I've told many, many times, and I'll probably go on telling it. It was only a couple of years back when I was just leaving home, probably walking up to um, the Valfe. And I was just walking past our letterbox just out the front. And I heard the Holy Spirit clear as a bell say to me, You're very comfortable, aren't you? <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, I guess I am. And I'm just waiting because I, I, I know the voice of the Spirit of God. That that was the Holy Spirit. And there's nothing more. I kept walking, listening, walking, listening, walking, listening. <laughs> nothing more. And I guess it was just a challenge saying, you're comfortable where you are. Is that where you want to stay? I mean, that's the next part that was the inference that he didn't say. And I just put to you, you might be comfortable where you are, but the cloud is beginning to arrive. Amen. Because the cloud is beginning to arrive, God is saying, I want you to move on with me. I want you to move on with me. So as we, and, and we have a visiting speaker next Sunday morning, 
Maybe the Sunday after that, I just want to take this a little bit further. God is arising. It's like to me there's a stirring. God is saying, I want to move. I want to move. Would you, will Vision Christian family move with me? Will this be a church? And, and, and the church's decision will be based on we as individuals making that decision. Am I willing to move on as the cloud rises? How about we pray, musicians, if you would come. Now, Father, Father, I just thank you. I thank you that you're a God. You're the only one who doesn't change. You say, Malachi, I am the Lord my God, I change not. Father, as we follow you, we change to be more like you. Father, we, as a body together, we're at a certain point, a certain place. Father, there's just a sense that you're saying, hey, I'm arising. Cloud is lifting from over the camp. The cloud is going to move on. But in that rising, and the rising of God in the midst, He's going to do an amazing thing. But it's going to mean moving outside of our comfort zone. Father, I just pray, give us a heart that is so entwined with You. Father, it's not that we choose change, but we choose You. And as we choose You, we choose all that comes with that choice. Father, you are, you're stirring up, you're, you're stirring the comfort zone of different ones. I just pray, arise in our midst. Your enemies be scattered. For those who hate you, flee from before you. Smoke is driven away, so drive them away. Let them perish, even as wax before a fire. Melt before you as the Lord your God. Arise, O oh God. Give us a heart that will say yes. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.